me ask you to stand and uh, read what should be familiar verses to you. This will be the third week that we've looked at them. 1 Peter 1, verses 13 through 16. Uh, read this with me together, please. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Thank you. Please be seated. When you go to your physician for uh, a checkup, invariably the doctor checks your heart. Today, I'm not going to check your physical heart, but I'm going to check your spiritual heart. Are you spiritually healthy? When you go to your doctor, and uh, if, certainly if there is a heart problem, he or she asks about your diet. What are you taking in? What food are you consuming? And so when it comes to spiritual health, I ask you, what food are you taking in? Could it be that you're consuming some spiritual junk food which needs to be rejected? Uh, the Puritan John Flavel said, what health is to the heart, holiness is to the soul. What health is to the heart, holiness is to the soul. So how is your heart? How's your soul? We're learning that God calls His people to live holy lives. We read here, and if you have your Bible, you can open it with me to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. But as He who called you, he's talking to believers, as He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We are, the Scripture says, to pursue holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. And we have learned in these last couple of weeks that this idea of holiness, this sanctification, is being set apart, set apart from sin, set apart to God. And we have been learning, to put it in theological terms, that sanctification, our sanctification, is the inevitable result of our justification. Justification is God's work for us. Sanctification is God's work in us. Justification is sanctification begun. We've seen that when we're saved, we are justified and we are sanctified. Glorification is sanctification completed. So, we are, we can honestly say, we have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. We have been sanctified, we have been justified, we have been sanctified, set apart from God. Now, in the grace of God, as we'll learn today, we seek to live holy lives, looking forward to that great day of our glorification. Paul puts it this way in Romans 8, those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. You might have expected Paul to say, those whom he justified, he also sanctified. That is true. But Paul is saying something wonderful, that those who are saved, those who are justified, will certainly be glorified. Now, previously we considered the call of holiness and the pattern of holiness Today, we're thinking of the subject of the goal of holiness. What does holiness look like? Now, before looking at it positively, I thought we'd look at some false goals of holiness. I think I have five of them. They're a bit of a caricature. Uh, I may exaggerate a little bit of hyperbole uh, to make the point. You may recognize some elements of these goals in yourself. If so, that is wonderful. Um, and I may uh, successfully antagonize everyone in the sanctuary today. But there we are. Here is the first false goal. We saw it before. The false goal of sinless 
perfection. Let me introduce to you Mr. Perfect. Mr. Perfect believes, as we learned last week, that the goal, the, the goal of holiness is sinless perfection. And sometime after conversion, Mr. Perfect enters into a second stage of Christian blessing, whereby he attains a state of perfection. Perfect love, it's sometimes called. Entire sanctification. Now, to do that, Mr. Perfect does have a problem, so he has to redefine sin and say that perfection is freedom from a conscious transgression of a known law of God. What's his error? Mr. Perfect is making a theological error. He's making justification and sanctification separate gifts, which are separately obtained by separate acts of faith. He's justified. Now he enters into the second stage of blessing, and now he attains this entire sanctification, Mr. Perfect. What do we say to Mr. Perfect? We respect him. He's got a great goal. Uh, we admire that in him. But we have to say uh, that even the holiest of people, even someone like Mr. Perfect, have sinful thoughts, have impure motives. The Apostle John says in 1 John 1, if we say we have no sin, who are we deceiving? We're deceiving ourselves. Sinless perfection is not the goal of holiness. So, uh, we respect Mr. Perfect. He can be a bit of a pain in the neck sometimes in the church, but we're going to say goodbye to him, Mr. Perfect. Here is the second false goal, the false goal of health and wealth. We're going to call her Ms. Prosperity. You've met Ms. Pros Prosperity, haven't you, in her tribe? They believe that the goal of the Christian life is to be healthy, wealthy, and always very, very happy. She has embraced the prosperity gospel. Her heroes are pastors who fly around in their own jets. I've tried for years to get a helicopter. We've got a great landing spot right here on the lawn, and it hasn't come yet. But Miss Prosperity believes in this name and claim it. You heard this? Just name it and claim it. It's all a matter of your thinking. Call it out. If you name it, and claim it, God will give it to you. That is her approach to the Christian life. This is Christian triumphalism, where there's a denial of the reality of suffering, tears, and difficulties in life. If we speak to Miss Prosperity and those that she admires, uh, they believe that suffering and trials are symptomatic of spiritual ill health. I've met many Miss Prosperities over the years. Some of them have been most distressed because they have been taught that if they are walking with God, uh, they're going to be healthy. And now so they've been diagnosed with some terrible illness, and they have been told that the reason they have not been cured of this illness is they don't have enough faith or there's some unconfessed sin in their life. Ms. How sad. Ms. Prosperity believes the goal of holiness is achieved when a state of emotionalism and prosperity are experienced. With Miss Prosperity, everything has to be fun, exciting, awesome, amazing. Uh, she reminds me a bit of a cappuccino, which is a lot of froth, but very little coffee. <laughs> if you go to Miss Prosperity's church, there's not much Bible uh, teaching. There may be a verse on the screen, usually plucked out of its context to suit the agenda of the preacher. There could be inspirational storytelling, a lot of hype, high noise, high emotion, but little substance. Now, holy living does affect our emotions. It does produce joy. Peter has told us, hasn't he, in verse 8 about this joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. But biblical Christianity, authentic Christianity, is based on truth on biblical doctrine where our minds are being renewed through the Word of God. The Apostle Peter, we have been le learning from the opening verses of First Peter 1. Uh, he talks about trials. He talks about suffering. After all, he's writing to people who are exiled. Yes, there is suffering in the Christian life. Luke, Luke writes in Acts 14, verse 22, through many tribulations, 
We must enter the kingdom of God. Yes, there is great joy in following Christ, but that does not eliminate suffering and trials and disappointment. So we're going to say goodbye to Miss Prosperity. We, we like her, not too much, but uh, we're going to say goodbye to her immature view of the Christian life, which is actually a very false and destructive view. Here is the third false goal of, of biblical knowledge. I want to introduce to you Mr. Commentary. He's a wonderful character. He believes that the goal of holiness is biblical knowledge. Mr. Commentary attends and may teach several Bible studies. He frequently reminds us that he loves in-depth Bible study, not just Bible study. His is really, they really dive deep. Uh, he tells us, he'll throw in a few Greek words uh, to prove the point. He's in his element when he's trying to explain some tricky exegetical problem or debating some erudite theological conundrum. He's in his element. He thinks this is what the Christian faith is all about. This results in Mr. Commentary having a very large head. Some of his critics say, I would never say a fat head, but uh, he's got a very large head. Paul tells us that there is a knowledge which puffs up, and here it is. Uh, for Mr. Commentary, uh, holiness is all about is an intellectual activity. Question is, we'd have to say to Mr. Commentary, what about your, your heart? Your head is full of biblical knowledge. Your head is full of doctrine, but has that information gone from your head to your heart? What difference is it making? See, Mr. Commentary has fallen into a very common trap. His Bible study is at the center of his life. He really thinks no one studies the Bible like him. He really thinks no one teaches the Bible like him. And uh, we've been challenged by Tim and Jim coming up for Christmas that we should all serve. It's unlikely that you'll see Mr. Commentary doing much ser serving over Christmas. He's doing his, his Bible study. Is biblical knowledge essential in a Christian life? Absolutely. At Calvary Church, we're committed to that. But here is, we must be very careful. Getting biblical knowledge, while it is essential in the Christian life, it's not the goal of holiness. You may be able, Mr. Commentary, to quote chapter and verse. You may have the most knowledge in your life group and uh, impress uh, the unwary, but you may not be holy. The question is, not our information, not how we feel like Miss Prosperity, but what is the goal? Here is another false goal of holiness, the false goal of activism. This is Ms. Worker. She's very busy in the church. Have you met Ms. Worker? Uh, she believes that the life of holiness is action and service. You don't need to tell her to serve. She's the first to volunteer. But she's so busy, she rarely attends a service like this. She rarely is in a life group. What's she doing? She's in the nursery. She's in the kitchen. She's in the Sunday school. She's buzzing around, always serving. And she loves to tell people of all the ministries she's been involved in over the years. She gives the impression that without her, these ministries would collapse. You say, John, we just had a couple of pastors appealing us to serve. Yes, you should serve. Holy people do enthusiastically serve the Lord, but activism is not the goal of holiness. It is possible to be very active in serving people, to be very involved in ministry, but not be holy. See, we're talking about the heart. She loves serving. She loves being seen serving. But really, she's not growing spiritually. She's in the spiritual rut. If she teaches Sunday school, she's teaching the same tired lessons that she first taught 20 years ago. She has not grown. She's pursuing a false goal. So we say goodbye to Miss Worker. That may mean none of you are going to volunteer now. That is not what I'm saying. Here's the fifth one, the false goal of legalism. 
Here is Mr. I call him Mr. Ruler. You ever met Mr. Ruler? You ever been in a church full of Mr. Rulers and Mrs. Rulers? Uh, Mr. Ruler gives the impression that the goal of holiness is to keep rules, particularly his rules. He's an expert. He's an expert on church policies. He's an expert on church traditions. Uh, he has lists of do's and don'ts, often uh, prepared by himself or others like him. He's a very opinionated individual, and he's a self-appointed rule enforcer. You ever been around him? He majors on law rather than grace. He majors, on, he majors on the letter of the law rather than the Spirit. Remember, Paul says, the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. He's very judgmental. But when you look at Mr. Ruler, and you look at churches where, which are led by Mr. Rulers, in the church there's often confusion. There's a lot of gossip. There's a lot of hypocrisy. There's a lot of false guilt. There's a lot of hurt people. There's a lot of division. Yes, some people like being told these little rules. And so Mr. Ruler generally has a following around him who affirm him in what he's doing, but in his wake, there's disaster. Chuck Swindoll, in his book, The Grace Awakening, uh, says this. He says, if I were to ask to name the major enemies of vital Christianity today, I'm not sure about what I wouldn't name legalism first. It kills congregations when a pastor is a legalist. It kills pastors when congregations are legalistic. Legalistic people with the rigid do's and don'ts kill the spirit of joy and spontaneity of those who wish to enjoy their liberty. Strict legalistic people in leadership drain the very life out of a church, even though they may claim they're doing God a service. He goes on to say, legalism is rigid, grim, exacting, and law-like in nature. Now, that's written by a seasoned pastor who certainly knew what he was writing about. You say strong words, yes, but legalism is not the goal of holiness. God calls us to holiness, and God calls us to freedom, not to legalistic bondage. Listen to the Apostle Paul as he deals with the legalists in Galatians 5, verse 1. He says, for freedom Christ has set us free. There's a bondage of the law, but he says, stand firm, therefore, and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. We are followers of Christ. We've been saved by grace. Why are you going back into a law-like atmosphere? And then he says in verse 13, for you were called to freedom, brothers. You say, that's wonderful. Ah, but there's a caution here. But don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Yes, that's it. The Christian life is not to be reduced to a set of do's and don'ts. We are to obey God, not the rules of the legalists. The legalist is conf concerned with how people look, how they appear. And uh, in churches ruled by the legalists, they can become almost cult-like, where people have to think a certain way and look a certain way. God calls us to freedom. Authentic Christianity is a living, internal, joyful relationship with a risen Jesus Christ. Paul says, it is Christ living in me. So, we, we're going to say goodbye to Mr. Ruler and his legalism. We have to admit in most of us, there is the spirit sometimes of Mr. Ruler, sometimes the spirit of Ms. Activism or prosperity. All of these things sometimes creep into our lives, don't they? Well, what is the goal of, lo of holiness? Here it is. The goal of holiness is Christ-likeness, is to be like Christ. And the wonder of the gospel is that God in His grace not only saves us, He has predestined us to be like His perfect Son. Turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, where we will see this. Ro 
Romans 8, 28. We love this verse. We know there are many things in the Christian life that we don't know. There are many mysteries and difficulties in life, but this we do know. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Isn't that an incredible promise? I don't understand many things that have happened in my life, but I do know that God is working them for good. For those who are called according to His purpose, for those whom He foreknew, He also predestined, here it is, to be conformed to the image of His Son, in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom He predestined, He also called. And those whom He called, He also justified. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. Brother, sister, you are predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son of God. That's mind-blowing in its implications, isn't it? We know from Scripture that in the beginning, God made us in the image, in His image. We are made in the image of God. But then sin comes into the Garden of Eden, remember, in Genesis 3. And because of sin, the image of God in us is distorted and scarred. It's not totally obliterated, but it's terribly marred and scarred. It's like looking in a mirror uh, that has been cracked. And you see yourself, but it's distorted. That's us in our fallen condition. How is the image of God in us going to be restored? Is that possible? Sin is devastating. It's devastating to ourselves, and it's devastating in its implications to those around us. What's the answer? Here is the gospel, that God in His love sends His Son into this world not to condemn those who have sinned, who have these marred and scarred images, but He sends His Son to transform us. Paul writes to the church at Colossae that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. How can you have an image of, of something which is invisible? But Jesus Christ comes. God is spirit. No one has seen God. But now in Jesus Christ, God comes to us, Emmanuel, God with us. And as we look at Jesus Christ, we see God perfectly. He who has seen me has seen the Father. He is the perfect image of God. And now God's plan for His people is that they become like His Son. We're members of this family. God is our Father. Jesus Christ is the elder brother. And now, through the miracle of the gospel, we are being pre predestined to become the in the image of Jesus Christ. Some of you, I've never done this, but I have friends who buy cars which are, are wrecked, and uh, there they are. This car has been in a terrible accident. It's a very poor representation of the original design and construction. Once this car was perfect, but now it is broken. It's, it's a wreck. Here's an individual who buys this car, and slowly the process of restoration begins to restore this car to its original condition. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of care. It takes a lot of money sometimes and a lot of patience. God, our God, our Father, is in the restoration business. Psalm 23, David writes, He restores my soul. David knew what it was to dishonor God. God is in the restoration business. He takes broken people like us, people who make a wreck of their life like us, people who deliberately go against God, and He reaches down. Not only does He forgive our sins, there has begun now this wonderful work of restoration in us to make us more and more like Jesus. In Psalm 24, the question is asked, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in His holy place? 
Is there anyone here who could stand in the holy place? We sang the question. It's really the same question in Psalm 23. Is there anyone worthy to open that scroll in Revelation 5? In the whole universe, who is able to stand in the holy place? Who is worthy and able to open the scroll? Our Lord Jesus Christ was the first person, as it were, who climbed God's holy mountain, who stood in that holy place. Because those who come are to have clean hands and a pure heart. Your hands are dirty. Your heart is impure. You cannot stand before a holy God. And now what we can do, God in Christ has done, that in the gospel, I want you to grasp this. This is so important. In the gospel, not only are your sins forgiven, in the gospel, we are united to our Lord Jesus Christ. We sang that about the imputation, that in our salvation, Christ takes our sins and we receive His righteousness. I am united with Christ in His death, His burial, and resurrection. And through this union with Christ, <clears throat> His sanctification, which He accomplished for me, is now mine. So, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1 that in Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus has become to us sanctification. Now, in the grace of God, I can ascend that holy hill. Now, in the grace of God, I can stand in the holy place, not because of any innate holiness in myself, certainly not because of my works, certainly not based on anything I have done, but purely in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. His sanctification is mine. I have received Christ. I am united with Him. And now in this wonderful spiritual process, if you're a follower of Christ, you're involved in this, I'm involved in this, God, through His Spirit, is transforming us more and more to be like Jesus. When we receive Christ as our Savior, God graciously, through His Spirit, begins this process of transformation this process of progressive sanctification. We are works in process. Turn with me to see this in 2 Corinthians. This is wonderful. 2 Corinthians 3. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is again freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, unlike Moses going up the mount is the context, we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Think of that. The Christian is involved the word transformed here is the word from which we get metamorphosis. We're involved in a metamorphosis. We are in a process of being changed into the image of Jesus Christ. And here's my point. I want you to get it today. The more you listen to Jesus, the more you look at Jesus, the closer you follow Jesus, the more you will become like Him. Isn't that true? All of us are involved in this process. You say, well, it's a very slow process with me, but could it be because you're not looking at Christ very much? Robert Murray McShane says, for every look at self, take ten, for, take ten looks at Christ. Christian life is looking to Christ. It's beholding the image of Christ. And as I do that, I'm becoming more and more like my Savior. And the main means of sanctification is the Word of God. 
Listen to the words of Jesus, familiar verses. John 17, verse 17, sanctify them. There's, there's our word. Sanctify, make them holy. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word, Scripture, is truth. As you sent me into the world, Jesus is praying to his Father, so I have sent them into the world, and for their sake I consecrate myself. Most translations say I sanctify myself, same word, the verb hagiazo, from which we get hagiosmos, the sanctification. I, Jesus is saying, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. How wonderful. Here I am reading my Bible. The truth of God. And as I do so, I'm hearing God. I'm focused on the Word of God. And you say, well, will any of us reach that perfect likeness of Christ? Not during this life. Uh, John writes, no, but when we see Him, we shall be like Him, for we'll see Him as He is. That's our glorification. But now here we are in time. We're becoming more and more like Jesus. The goal of holiness is to be like our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says in Romans 13, verse 14, he writes, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. This morning you got up, we put on our clothes. This morning when you get up as a Christian, what are we doing? We're putting on the clothes of Jesus Christ. We're clothing ourselves with Christ. We're putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, John, John, that sounds very mystical. What clothes are you putting on? The fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Are you a loving person? You've got a lot of information. You're running around serving the Lord. That's wonderful, but what about your love? What about peace? So many people not at peace. Remember what Jesus says when He says to come to Me and learn of Me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. There's gentleness. There's humility. And you will find rest for your souls. Why are so many of us lacking peace and rest for our souls? A humble dependence on Jesus produces peace, humility. Have you noticed the arrogant person, the very proudful person? They're never at peace. They're never at rest. They're always trying to impress someone. They're always trying to put someone down. They're always trying to show their superiority. They never really accept the identity that they have and the gifts and the talents that they have. They're, they're not at peace. But Jesus says, if you come to me and learn of me, what am I to learn from Jesus? Gentleness, humility, joy. You joyful person. Oh, I caricatured Miss Prosperity, but what about joy in you? Are, you? are you a joyful Is there joy in your home? Is there joy in your heart, joy in your relationships? Are you, are you a kind person? It's amazing how unkind Christians can be, can't we? And we have got all of this knowledge, all of this information. What about self-control? These are the graces that I put on. Remember, Paul says, be kind to one another. Is God kind? Is God gracious? Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. And then he goes on to talk in, in Ephesians 5 about being imitating Christ in the self-sacrificial love. That's it, isn't it? Very convicting, isn't it? Oh, I know a lot about the Bible. 
I'm a pastor. I serve the Lord every day. That doesn't mean I'm a holy person. That doesn't mean that I'm exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit. And so I'm very deliberately and consciously put on my Lord Jesus Christ. And if you say you love Christ, you want to listen to Him, and you want to be like Him. And the wonderful thing is that's not all your own effort. That there is a wonderful spiritual transformation. How wonderful when we see it in a brother or sister, don't we? Someone has come to Christ, and their life has changed. Good news just the other day told me that in her maternal grandfather, when he came to Christ, the whole home was changed. Different home, different way of speaking to his wife, different way of conducting business. Why? Because we put on the Lord Jesus Christ. When a painter is painting a portrait, the painter looks to the person and then looks to the canvas, then back to the person and then back to the canvas, trying to reproduce on the can canvas what she sees in the person. I'm to keep looking to Jesus, keep looking to Him. And the more I look to Him, the more I will be like Him. As I listen to His Word, as I commune with Him, as I meet with my brothers and sisters who encourage me to be more like Christ and who admonish and rebuke me when I'm so often un-Christ-like. We began the service last Sunday by singing that old chorus, turn your eyes on Jesus. Isn't that it? Do you do that every day? Can you do that? Not your iPhone. But turn your eyes on Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Some of you here are feeling battered and scarred by sin, aren't you? You need to come to Christ. You need a touch of the Master's hand. How wonderful that God sees us bruised and broken, and in great love sends His Son to rescue us. And He says, come to Me. Will you come and be touched and healed by the touch of the Master's hand? Because the Word of God to us today is this, but as He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Father, help us to do that. Thank you for the means of grace that you give us. We are indwelled by the Spirit. You give us your Word, which is truth. You give us our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us daily to put Him on us. And there's some here who are broken. Their life is wrecked because of sin. Thank you for bringing them here. May they humble themselves, repent of their sin, and look to Christ and say, come and save me. And may all of us be touched and changed by that supernatural touch of the Master's hand. We thank you in His name. Amen.